So I was serving with 40 Commando, Royal Marines, back in 2007. And on the 7th of September that year, my unit deployed out to Afghanistan for the start of a six-month tour. Christmas Eve, 2007, we had been in theatre for three, maybe three and a half months, and we were due to go out on a, a routine foot patrol. Now, in the three and a half months that we'd been there, we had been out on numerous foot patrols, um, some quite in detail, you know, 14, 15 hour days, pushing two, three, four miles out from the base that we're working from, some not so challenging, more around the local area, and more to do with winning hearts and minds than pursuing the enemy. Now, in the early hours of Christmas Eve morning, myself and some of my colleagues were called up to the headquarters compound of the base that we were working out of, and we were given a brief on what was to be our next foot patrol. So we were given our orders, we went back to our compound, we started preparing all of our kit and equipment, and around about half past 10 that morning, we went back up to the headquarters compound, we formed up by the rear entrance of our camp, and we got ready to leave for the day. Now, the idea of this patrol was that we would leave the rear entrance of our camp in two sections, with eight men in each section. One would go north, one would go south. We were told to just to patrol the immediate perimeter around the camp. We weren't allowed to push any more than 300 meters from the perimeter wall. Then when we were finished, we would meet this time at the front entrance of the camp, so now the opposite side. We would then secure the location, close things down and finish up for the day. And when we got back in the camp, we were going to be given two or three days R&R &R so we could try and do the best we could given our situation to try and enjoy Christmas. So in terms of what we'd done to that point, it was relatively easy. So the time came, we were formed up by the rear entrance of the camp, we were given the green light, the rear gate was opened and we left. I was second in command of the section that went north, the other guys went south, and we went out and did all the usual basic low-level infantry style tactics and soldiering that we'd done to that point. About six hours later, both these sections now found themselves on the opposite side of camp at the front entrance, ready to secure the location, close things down, and finish up for the day. Now, the section that I was in, they just happened to be positioned on a really high piece of ground. It was a piece of ground that we called the North Fort, which was one of our target indicators. If we ever came into contact with the enemy, we would use that specific piece of land as a target indicator. Now, beneath us slightly was the camp that we were working out of. And then way, way, way down beneath that, just off to the side of the main dirt road that ran through the area, was the other section that we left with earlier in the day. So being on such a high piece of ground, we were in a very tactically advantageous position because we could see everything around us. And in a firefight, it's a lot easier to fight downhill than it is up. So we were tasked with giving those other guys what we call overwatch, which is effectively protection. And then they would peel back into the camp, they would get behind the perimeter wall, they would return the favor and provide us with overwatch. We would come off the high feature come down to where they were and then climb back up the incline into camp and finish up for the day. So, you know, like I said, in terms of what we've done to that point, very, very basic, very, very simple. So we were given our task in, we're up on the high feature, the section commander took his half of the section and he started giving them fire positions and areas of responsibility. I took my half and I jumped into a like a shallow bowl about five meters to my front. For me at that time, that provided, in my mind, what I thought was the best form of protection. There was nothing really we could have taken cover behind. So I thought, if we got in this little crater, got on our bellies, you're only really going to see a small portion of, of our helmets. So we jumped in. I stood back. The guys, they knew what they were doing. They took up their positions. I did a few last-minute checks. They eventually all got into position. They turned around and gave me the thumbs up. I did one or two more last minute checks just to make sure that we were we were tight and we were defensive in the event of a, a small arms attack from the enemy and then when I was happy and they were happy 
I started slowly walking over to the position that I selected for myself. And as I got there, I went to get onto my stomach. And as my right knee hit the floor, that was the minute that I knelt on and detonated an improvised explosive device. Now I remember the entire incident in, in graphic detail. Um, I'm not going to go into graphic detail, but what I can tell you about the next 35 to 45 minutes of my life was that it was the, the most intense and I don't mind admitting the, the scariest time of my life. And it's not something that I'd ever, ever want to experience again. Now, during that 35 to 45 minutes, the kind of things that did happen included me having to pick up my foot off the floor, which was still semi-attached to my leg and still in a boot and, and cradle it on my stomach while the, the medic that came to get me put me on a stretcher and evacuated me off this high feature. I was then put into the back of a vehicle and as the vehicle was climbing up an incline to go back into the camp, I fell out the back and the guy driving it swung around, reached out to grab something to hold me in and ended up grabbing the femur bone coming out of my right leg. And then when the helicopter landed and the tailgate dropped, I blacked out, which is when I have since found out that I was clinically declared dead. And then I was loaded on the back of a, a Chinook helicopter and the medics that were there performed a procedure on me which had only been had only been cleared to be used by the, the top brass in the medical field three days prior to the incident. And it involved drilling into somebody's tibia or fibula to give them an intravenous line because all my veins had collapsed. They couldn't get any fluids into me. So the next step was to drill into my tib or my fib, but I didn't have one because the explosion had completely taken off both my legs through the knee. So these guys made a, a very quick and I'm grateful for a very smart decision. And they decided to drill into my hip bone, one from the front, one from the back and put a line in using that method. And fortunately for me, they said about three minutes later, once the fluid had taken effect, I was awake and responsive. And when they were asking me questions, I wasn't just babbling a response. I was coherently answering the questions that they were giving me. So they flew me back to a place called Camp Bastion, um, where I was taken off the helicopter, put into the back of an ambulance, and then taken to a field hospital, which back at the end of 2007, uh, we didn't have any concrete purpose-built field hospitals. It was just military tents. And there were a couple of surgeons on duty. They had a look at the damage to my legs, to my arm, and they decided that the only way that they were going to be able to save my life is if they amputated both my legs above the knee, where the flesh was good and healthy, and my right arm above the elbow. Now, as soon as those guys had, had operated and they had stabilized me and they thought that I could survive a flight back home, they put me in a plane, they flew me back to the UK and I arrived in Selly Oak Hospital in Birmingham at about four o'clock in the morning on Christmas Day. When I got there, I spent three days unconscious in a coma and then another four days on the intensive care ward with round-the-clock medical care because the the explosion had, had tore a lot of flesh off and a lot of skin and, and all the dirt had been blasted up into it. So I was quite a high infection risk. So they had to make sure that no infections took while I was in hospital. They monitored me around the clock, gave me the necessary drugs and stuff. And four days later, I was moved up to what was called the bones and plastics ward, which is where I was to start my long road to recovery. Now that was an interesting period. Um, I, I was relatively positive pretty much from the moment I woke up. All the people around me were relatively positive. It wasn't always genuine, but we all, I think, thought that it helped. You know, it was the only real option was to tr keep trying to focus on the positives, to bounce off each other and to pull each other through what was a very, very difficult time. And three and a half weeks into it, a gentleman knocked on the door to my hospital room. Now there was, it was one of these doors which was kind of like a big oak thing with a rectangular glass panel in it. And so he knocked on the door and I looked out and I didn't recognize his face, but I invited him in. And he came in my room and he introduced himself to me as the country's leading medical professional 
in the field of amputation. So we're in January 2008 now. So at that point, for 33 plus years, this guy had been traveling around the world, amputating people's limbs, following up their progress and studying. And that, that was his world. He was the, the UK's guru. And he came in and he said to me, Mark, you need to start mentally preparing yourself for the rest of your life in a wheelchair. And then he went on to explain that in his vast experience, he had never met anybody with just one leg missing above the knee that had any success using prosthetics. And then he elaborated and went on to tell me that it was so painful to wear a prosthetic. It took so much energy to use one and that they were so difficult to use that most people just put them in the cupboard, got in their wheelchair and they got on with their life. And then he turned around and left. Now, that wasn't really what I wanted to hear at that time. You know, I'm 24 years old. I've just sustained these injuries. I'm trying to be positive and move on with my life. And then the country's expert effectively came and told me that my life was over. So I went into quite a dark place. Um, I just kind of went inside myself for a couple of days, turned away visitors, didn't answer my phone, just tried to process what it was this guy had told me and then figure out a way for me to move forward. Now, fortunately, about a week later, another guy knocked on my door. And again, I didn't recognize him. He pressed his face up against the glass panel. I was feeling a little bit better at this point, so I invited him in. And this guy opened the door and he came walking in my room wearing a set of prosthetic legs. Uh, this guy's name was Mick Brennan. Mick came in and he sat down and he told me his story about how he was injured by a suicide bomber in 2005. He told me what he was doing with his life at that point. Um, and... In early 2008, Mick was still serving in the army. He was on the Paralympic development team. He had children. You know, he was living this great life. And he talked me through his story about how he got from where I was in a hospital bed to where he was doing all the great things that he was doing. And so he kind of ignited a fire in me and he gave me some hope and some motivation. And so I got a laptop brought in my room. I got hooked up to the internet and I started doing all of all my own research on prosthetics, amputees, amputations, in particular triple amputees. I wanted to find somebody somewhere in the world who had my level of injuries that wasn't just living life in a wheelchair. So after six weeks in hospital, I moved to Headley Court Rehabilitation Centre, which is where once I'd healed, I was going to eventually be issued with my prosthetics and start learning to walk again. Now, Rehab, um, I could talk for hours and days about rehab, uh, so many stories about that time in my life, but you know, the one thing I will say is, is it pushed me, it pushed me mentally, physically and emotionally to my breaking point and sometimes beyond, you know, there was blood, there was sweat, there were tears, there were a lot of temper tantrums uh, that came from me, but I knew that it was all part of a process. You know, and from the day I got there, I'd set myself goals about what I wanted to achieve. And every day when I woke up, I just focused on those goals, focused on doing a little bit better. Even if it was just 1%, even if I just walked one step further that day, to me, that was progress and that was success. And so when I woke up in the morning and, you know, my groin was bleeding or my back was sore or I had blisters on my legs... I just kept focusing on those goals and thinking about what Mika told me and what was possible if I just put in the work and just kept my mind in the right place and kept positive and kept on focusing on moving forward. Now, at various stages through rehab, both when I was at Headley Court and when I was at home on sick leave, I, I was achieving all these, these little goals that I'd set for myself and I was quite proud and I was making progress, I was moving forward, but I kept on hitting brick walls and I kept plateauing and, and really struggling to get through them and to get over it and throughout my research I found a guy in America who back in 2002 when he was 15 was was hit by a train and became a triple amputee and what this guy was doing was phenomenal he, he was doing all the things that I imagined myself doing but was really really struggling to achieve and so I used to watch his videos and his blogs and his vlogs and read everything and get some inspiration from that. And it would help me push through my plateaus, break through those barriers and then achieve the next level in my rehab. Now, to cut a long story short, I eventually reached out to him. The guy's name was Cameron Clapp. I told him my story 
he got back to me, he told me his, he helped me and coached me uh, via emails. And then eventually on the 9th of June, 2009, I flew out to America, to Oklahoma City, to meet Cameron and to spend three weeks training with him and try and gain as much knowledge and wisdom and information as I could from him about his entire journey to get to where he was in the, in the hope that it would help accelerate my journey and get me somewhere close to, or anywhere close to the kind of level that he was at. And so that's what I did on the 9th of June, 2009. I jumped on a plane, headed out to Oklahoma City, met Cameron, met his team of prosthetists and doctors and clinicians. They trained me for three weeks solid. And, and I won't lie, it was, it was brutal. Three weeks solid, no wheelchair, no carers, none of the stuff that I was used to. Just every day getting up, putting on the prosthetics, gritting my teeth through the pain, and then going out there and just walking around and, and living a normal life outside of a, a rehabilitation environment. Now, as hard as that three weeks was, I knew that it was a means to an end. It was what I call short-term pain for long-term gain. And it changed my life. That The 9th of June 2009, when I went to meet Cameron, was the last time I ever used a wheelchair. So it's going to be 10 years for me this year. And it gave me a whole new level of independence. You know, and I came back and I was wheelchair free. I was a full-time prosthetic user. And I was happy. I was pleased with where I was. Now, I had some difficult decisions to make when I got back. Uh, the most difficult one for me was deciding that I had to leave the Royal Marines. I knew my career was over. You know, I could have got a desk job. I could have sat and done some sort of clerical work, but I knew I could never get promoted. I knew I could never deploy again. And it wasn't what I joined the military for in the first place. So, you know, I made a tough decision to leave. And I did that in July 2010. And I've just been on a crazy adventure ever since for the last nine years. Just living a life that actually I'm very grateful for. Because as tragic as this was and as bad as it may seem, it's opened a lot of doors. It's given me a lot of opportunities. It's enabled me to experience a lot of things that I don't think I ever would have had the chance to had I not been forced to walk this path that I have. So, you know, out of out of tragedy has, has come something great. And I've got, you know, a wonderful family now, a wife, three children. I've got a job, like a career. I work for the Royal Meets Charity. I've been doing that for the last seven years. And things are good, you know. They're not without their challenges, you know, but no one's life is. You know, every day is different for me. I wake up and one day I could be walking great, one day not so great. But that's life and, and I accepted that early on and I just do everything I can every day to, to focus on the good in my life and the things that I can be grateful for rather than the bad in my life and the things that perhaps I couldn't.